When you go out, you take a chance. What So welcome, welcome, welcome to Therapia. We're just about to begin. It's good to see you. Keep on coming online and as you do so, please make sure that you can be able to invite a friend by tagging them. At the same time also beginning a watch party or even going ahead to share the link. Share the link to some friends that you have. Let them get to have the link. You could share it even to WhatsApp groups. Let that link go to groups that you have in WhatsApp or friends that you believe can be blessed. Tag somebody, write their names, type it somewhere. Let them come online. We're about to begin this program. But in the meanwhile, let's get blessed by Kambua with this wonderful song. It's a song I've loved so much. Victor, good to see you. I know today you're bringing more friends. Beware Chini ya kicheko Namlash good to see you Wakufuta machozi yaliyofichwa Chini ya kicheko changu So remember, as you come in online, go ahead and just share. I want you to do me the favor of sharing this link, even to WhatsApp groups that you are in. Just send the link there, um, tag somebody, and also just start a watch party if need be, so that somebody can also be able to join in, and uh, so that we can immediately start off and get blessed with today's program. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God in the highest. Well, we thank God for that. That was a number by one powerful woman of God known as Kambua. I've loved the song and I usually play it over and over because I find it to be current based on the circumstances and situations that people may be in more so in this season. I want us to go straight to the word today. We are going to be dealing with a topic this week entitled The Spirit of Faith. That's what we're going to be looking at. The Spirit of Faith will be the topic that we are focusing on. And so we will go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and we're going to be reading verses number 13. Second Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse 13. Again, remember that even as you're coming online, I want you to go ahead and share. Uh, just press that button share that is below on your right hand side of the screen or even just go ahead and begin a watch party and if possible also just tag a friend by typing their name somewhere and asking them to come online. The moment you just type their name, uh, I think they will, if they are online, they will be able to immediately tap into the program or share the link to some WhatsApp groups and uh, let people be blessed at large in Jesus' precious name. Second Corinthians chapter number 4 verse number 13 is what we are going to be looking at. Let's pray as we begin. Lord, we commit this program into your hands, believing that your hand will be upon this program today as we begin. I trust that God, you will speak to your people in the name of Jesus. The revelation of your word will be fresh today. That God, it will come forth and impact the lives of everyone that is tuning in in the name of Jesus. So Lord, use me by oiling my head and God grant me utterance even as I speak your oracles today in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen and amen. So go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, number 4 and verses number 13. Remember, the topic for this week we are going to be looking at is what we consider as the spirit of faith. The spirit of faith is the topic we will be looking at. The Bible says we having the same spirit of faith. Underline that if in case that's your Bible. According as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore 
speak. Now, Paul is actually speaking a scripture that he had actually quoted from David, who had actually mentioned this in the book of Psalms. Uh, this exact verse, he picked it from the book of Psalms, and then he was able to quote it. Uh, but if you look at the entirety of the entire chapter, from verse number one going all the way down, you will notice that he makes that statement in between certain points or scriptures in which he mentions processes. So you will see him talking about the death of Christ at work in him later on, talking about several things about how death is at work in him and that life may be generated for other people. And that's when now in between those scriptures, he ends up mentioning that there is a spirit and that spirit is called the spirit of faith, which he says, if we bear within us, then we speak because we have that spirit in us. When I was praying, even last week when we were coming to the conclusion in preparation for this week and what God would be speaking to us this week, God began to mention to me that it's very important that the believers get to understand faith in a more deeper way. Remember, we are living in dark times, seasons when there's all manner of uh, uh, what we call oppression, depression, hopelessness. Everything that can be able to break down a person is all availed. The number of... Uh, uh, what we consider as negative reports are uh, ever increasing just in news if you keep on watching you will keep on hearing stories of how people are killing each other uh, you know people are losing their children and stuff like that so we are having all manner of bad reports repeating themselves until somebody would wonder when we will ever get any good report now this is to tell you that the moment you begin to see darkness and we are living in the days of Isaiah chapter number 60 and the Bible says in verse number 1 arise and shine for thy light has come so the power to rise out of the depressive moments, the oppressive moments, the darkness that is around us is only built on the quality of light that is made available to us. He says, arise and shine for thy light, your light, your revelation, your rema, uh, the word has been availed to you. So that means that we only break forth in these dark seasons because of the light that is available. A man once made a statement and this is what he said. He said, we don't focus on the darkness around us, but rather the light that is available because light by itself has a capacity of scattering every level of darkness that may be around us. So as believers, we do not live by sight, but by faith. And that faith is built on God's word. So while we are going to be looking at this topic that is actually focused on the spirit of faith, the Lord began to deal with me concerning this because God told me people are full of negative reports. And because negative reports are fully surrounding people, guys need to be full of something else that can be able to counter whatever is out and working against them. Remember the Bible says in the book of First John that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world so we have to ensure that the greater one in us is completely uh you know given room to to rule so that whatever works on the outside cannot dominate or work against us all right so that's why we are looking at this aspect of the spirit of faith there are four dimensions or let me just rather correct that and say there are five dimensions of faith for us to be able to understand the lesson that we are about to deal with number one is what we call common faith there's what we know as common faith. Peter speaks about this uh, in the book of First Peter, uh, Second Peter, rather, chapter number one and verses number one. We could just go there uh, so that we could be able to just uh, get confirmation of this. When Peter is speaking, uh, he's speaking to a group of people and he actually is trying to encourage them uh, concerning the aspect of faith. So Peter speaks about what we consider as common faith. So there's a first type of faith which is actually known as common faith. I will get the scripture. I've just misplaced, misplaced it a little, but I will give it to you. And then the second type of faith that we have is known as the measure of faith. The measure of faith. The book of Romans chapter number 12, when Paul is speaking about the need of people understanding in their giftings he actually mentions about god giving each person the measure of faith so there's common faith then there's a measure of faith number three is the law of faith the law of faith that's romans chapter number three and verses number 27 the law of faith and then number four is what we call the gift of faith first corinthians chapter number 12 if you read around verse number eight or verse number nine somewhere there in the book of first corinthians you will see when paul talks about the gifts of the spirit one of the gifting that paul talks about is a gift of faith and then the fifth one is what we know as a spirit of faith so five dimensions of faith that are revealed in the bible the first one is what we consider as common faith the second one is a measure of faith the third one is the law of faith the fourth one is a gift of faith and the last one is a spirit of faith which will become our emphasis now 
just to try and help you understand everything i will try to build each one of them uh, little by little and precept upon precept so that we can be able to understand where we are going to so let's start with the first one which is known as common faith now common faith is a faith that is given to all believers uh, i think i should correct the scripture it was paul speaking to titus and paul tells titus uh, remember all of us that are actually brought into the common faith so common faith is the faith that is given to all believers when a person gets born again in romans chapter number 10 uh, in verse number eight the bible says the word is nigh is in your mouth is in your heart and it is nigh thee romans 10 and verses number eight and then he speaks of it being the word of faith the word of faith so when we are dealing with what we call common faith we are talking about faith given to all believers romans 10 and verse 17 says faith cometh by hearing and by hearing god's word so every person who got born again has been able to receive what we consider as common faith faith that brings us into a common acceptance of acknowledging that jesus is lord and we can only only get to the Father only through Christ alone. That's what we know as common faith. That's a faith that is geared towards God. That is a faith that we built on in our salvation. The second type of faith is what we could know as the measure of faith. Now that's what we looked at in Romans chapter number 12. And uh, if you read it from verse number, somewhere verse number 8, Paul again speaking about faith mentions that God has dealt with every man the measure of faith. Now notice that when he's talking, he says to every man, and when Paul is mentioning that word to every man, Paul wants us to understand that all human beings have the measure have a measure of faith so that is to say that a human being cannot be able to live without some dimension of faith the only difference is uh, if you compare it with common faith is that common faith is clearly focused towards God and focused towards our Christian work but when we're looking at the measure of faith it can be focused in different levels so you'll find that there are people who have faith in relationships faith in their spouses faith in their children faith in their gifts faith in their businesses, faith in their career, and faith in various other factors. So you can gear your faith into different uh, spheres of life. So that's what we know as the measure of faith, because to live the life we are living, you actually require faith. You wake up and you actually wake up. You go to sleep by faith. You wake up by faith. You believe that when you will sleep, you will wake up and you will still be alive. And listen to me, there are many people that sleep and don't wake up. Uh, you eat by faith. You just have faith and your food is not poisoned. I mean, most of the things that the human beings do, <clears throat> there's a faith dimension that is attached behind it. When people go to see the doctor, there's faith attached to it. So that's why they say, uh, that about 60 to 80 percent of the healing process when you go to a medic is already dealt with just by going for i mean going to consult a doctor or going to see a doctor just the fact that you sat down and opened up concerning your disease and the doctor was able to uh, to talk to you that deals with about 60 to 80 percent of a condition that you may have in your body the remaining requires the medications you know or whatever the doctor will end up leading you to do but they just say just the fact that you went to see them was enough to be able to bring healing to you a woman who used to go to hospital in one hospital we have here, MTRH, Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital, and they say this old woman used to believe that she did, and um, she used to believe that by being injected, her healing process would come quickly. So she always rejected the attribute of being given. Uh, oral medication in terms of tablets or anything that she should be able to drink. She just wanted to be injected. So the story goes that this woman, uh, when the doctors got to study that, they decided to do an experiment on her. So anytime she would go and because she would insist she doesn't want tablets or anything, they would end up in injecting her. And they say they would inject her with water. Guess what would happen? Immediately when the woman walked out, just a day or two, they got to realize the woman was quite okay. Why? Because in her mind, she already believed as long as it's an injection, that is enough to bring her into wholeness. So what I'm bringing out and I want you to understand is that we all have a measure of faith. Human beings have faith, but the only difference is that they express it in different ways. But comparing it to the common, common faith, the common faith is faith for the believer, for a person to come into Christ. That is a faith that makes you a Christian. That's what we call common faith. The third type of faith is the law of faith. The law of faith that's in Romans chapter 7 and chapter 3 and verse 27. Romans chapter 3 and verse 27 when Paul speaks about the law of faith. Now the law of faith are simply principles that the scripture has, has been able to give to us. Principles that the Bible expects us to adhere to or to follow or to practice in order to experience uh, what we consider as divine results. You know, when you live the life of faith, your life is no longer natural. Your life now becomes supernatural. The Bible says that these signs will follow them that believe. Matthew 16, 17. These signs will follow them that believe. So when you actually get 
get into believing, there are particular results that begin to follow you that make you automatically live a supernatural life. So you realize that that is where the law of faith actually appears in Joshua chapter number one and verses number eight. Joshua one and verse eight, uh, when Joshua <clears throat> was actually uh, uh, receiving uh, speakings from God or directives from God, in verse number eight, God tells Joshua that the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will do well to meditate it upon it day and night so that you may observe to do all that is therein and that you may make your way prosperous and have good success. So I want you to notice that in Joshua 1 and verse number 8, all that God is giving Joshua are principles, are laws of faith, laws of faith, that if Joshua just adheres to them, then his life will automatically generate good success and he will make his way prosperous. So you notice that there is what we call the law of faith. The Bible is laws. The Bible is full of laws. The word laws there are instructions. That word laws are also principles. So the Bible is full of laws, full of instructions. Now, when I'm mentioning the word laws, I want you to wipe or remove from your mind the law of Moses. Because if you begin to build that in your head, then you will begin to cut off what exactly God is speaking. That word laws is simply instructions. That word laws is also principles. For example, the Bible says, As long as the earth endureth, seed time and harvest time shall forever abide. So God clearly tells uh, Noah that as long as you abide in the realm of men or on the earth world, the only way you generate a harvest is by understanding the power of the seed. So these are things that you have to put within your mind so that you can be able to get into results you have never gotten. So that's what we call the law of faith. Principles or instructions availed in the scriptures that people are called to uh, practice or to adhere to and also to respond to in order to enjoy supernatural results. And then we have the gift of faith, which we actually have in the book of First Corinthians chapter Number 12 uh, from verse number 8, which speaks about the nine gifts of the Spirit. First Corinthians chapter number 12, if you read verse 8 to verse number 10, it actually gives us the nine gifts of the Spirit. And one of them is what we know as a gift of faith. The gift of faith is where there's a surging of faith in a person. Uh, it's a gift that God gives a person, but there's a surging of faith in a person. And by that surge of faith, God gives them authoritative speaking. So they speak because of a surge that they had of faith in a moment. It comes in a moment. And that moment, they speak, results break forth. A good example is when you see an evangelist standing on a podium and saying, today the dead will be raised, the sick will be healed. And the moment they make those utterances, all of a sudden faith is raised up in people. And you would notice that they can end up beginning to declare, blind eyes are opening, eyes open, deaf ears are opening. So it's not exactly a need or important for us to be laying hands on people in order to heal them. I say there are different ways to administer miracles. One of the ways is by using the gift of faith by utterance more so when the you are in the glory zone glory zone when the presence and the power of god saturates an atmosphere a minister is only called to begin to speak and in their utterance the atmosphere begins to experience a shift right there so that's where the gift of faith comes in sometimes when you do business you require that gift uh, when you are believing god in for certain things you require that gift it's important that you actually pray that this gift becomes a reality in your life but now the fifth one which will become our focus over this week is what we know as the spirit of faith. Now remember, we have actually just read the book of uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse number 13, and we've been able to observe what Paul says. He says, we bearing the same spirit of faith have believed, and therefore we have spoken. So Paul is speaking of what we consider as the spirit of faith. Now, the spirit of faith is defined in two ways. The first one is basically, it speaks of the fullness of faith in an individual. The fullness of faith in an individual. When you're talking about the spirit of faith, we are saying somebody is full of faith. So that fullness is that the spirit in them is, is, is completely full. They are full of faith within them. That's what it means to be uh, having the spirit of faith within you. It means that you have the fullness of faith within you. In the book of Acts chapter number six, we see a man called Stephan. Stephan or Stephen, based on how you want to pronounce it. Stephen, one of the deacons that is selected. The Bible talks of him being full of the Holy Ghost and being full of of faith. He was full of faith. So anytime somebody speaks of the spirit of faith, we are talking of one having fullness of faith within themselves. So that is why Paul says, we bearing the same spirit of faith have believed and therefore we have spoken. So definition number one of the word spirit of faith basically speaks of the fullness of faith in an individual. Somebody is full of faith. Number two, when we are talking of the fullness of faith, we are talking of the activation of the spirit in one. The activation 
of the spirit in one. It is where the Holy Ghost is activated or the spirit of a man when they are constantly relating with God in the place of prayer. The activation of faith is manifest in them. So that activation of faith causes them to speak out. All right, so they speak the language of the spirit. That's where things like speaking in other tongues begins to burst forth. That's where things like declaring things have been not as though they were begins to burst forth because their spirit is now activated. So because they are spiritually activated, they can talk things which a normal man cannot be able to speak. They can declare things which in the natural a person cannot be able to uh, just open their mouth and go ahead and decree because these things they are speaking are heavenly and when they speak it in the spiritual world, these things begin to manifest in the natural sphere. So number one, we say the spirit of faith talks about somebody being full of faith in them. They have the fullness of faith. And number two, we are talking about them not just having the fullness of faith. We are talking about them having the activation of faith. So somebody is activated. You're spiritually activated. Now, this then brings us then to an idea that there are only two ways that a person then can be able to operate, or three ways rather that a person can be able to operate in this dimension. The first one is through the law of impartation. The law of impartation, uh, that is the first way. Ezekiel chapter number two, verse number one, and verses number two expresses to us where we see impartation taking place. The Bible explains concerning Ezekiel and how God spoke to Ezekiel and told him to stand up. He said, son of man, stand up that I may speak to you. And the Bible says, as he spoke to him, the Bible says, as he was speaking, his spirit entered me. So something entered him when this man, when, when Ezekiel was commanded by God to stand up. And as he was hearing the word, there was an impartation. Romans chapter 10 and verses number 17. Romans 10, 17 also explains the same. We see impartation taking place. That's where the spirit of faith actually begins to birth itself. He says, and faith cometh by hearing and by hearing the word of God. So every time you hear there is an impartation of faith that comes into your life and it comes through impartation when you actually developed the art of hearing. The second way that we are actually able to experience this spirit of faith is by knowing how to engage in praying in the spirit oftenly. Praying in the spirit oftenly. Jude verses number 20. Jude verse number 20. The Bible says building up yourself in the most holy faith. Building up yourself in the most holy faith. Praying always in the spirit. Building up your yourself in the most holy faith, praying always in the spirit. So that means, in other words, for you to be able to move in that dimension of enjoying what we consider as a spirit of faith, you must begin to build within yourself the need of praying in the spirit. When you pray oftenly in tongues or you pray oftenly in the spirit, the spirit of faith continually grows within you. All right? Jude verse number 20, praying oftenly. Remember what it says, praying, building up yourself rather in the most holy faith, building up your yourself in the most holy faith, praying always in the spirit. All right. So every time you pray in the Holy Ghost, something faith grows in you. Faith begins to develop within you. First Corinthians chapter number 14 and verses number three. The Bible says, whoever speaks in tongues edifies himself. He utters mysteries. He utters mysteries. He utters mysteries that men cannot be able to understand. So praying in the spirit basically brings edification, self-edification. You become edified. Your inner man becomes built. And that's one of the reasons why anytime you begin to feel like you're weak in the spirit, build a culture within yourself to pray in tongues. You know the advantage of prayer is a prayer is not limited to a certain timeline, like 5 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock at midnight. The Bible says men ought always to pray. Luke chapter number 18. So you can pray when you're working. You can pray while you're driving. You can pray while you're washing your clothes. You can pray while you're cooking. And the advantage of praying in tongues is that when you pray in tongues, it's a whisper in a language in the spirit. So anytime you feel weary, build within yourself the culture of praying oftenly in tongues. And you will begin to notice that an energy begins to be released within you. Romans chapter number 8 and verses number 26. Romans 8 and 26 says, The Spirit of God knoweth our infirmities. The word infirmities there speaks of limitations. He knoweth our limitations. But what does it say? But he prayed for us when we do not know what we ought to pray for. The Spirit prayed for us according to God's will with growings that words cannot be able to express. So the Holy Ghost, whenever you pray in tongues, 
comes it's a spirit of God energizing you something begins to happen in your inner man you become edified according to first Corinthians chapter number 14 from verse number three to verses number five you become energized so the spirit of faith begins to build within you when you build within yourself that uh, uh, the wisdom of praying oftenly in tongues so number one the best way that you can actually be able to tap into the spirit of faith is number one through impartation okay through impartation. Stay around people or stay around someone's. Listen to someone's oftenly uh, from men of God that you know are greatly anointed, your own pastor, your own leaders, people that you believe that every time they are speaking, something enters you. Because sometimes your faith may go low, but the measure of the spirit of faith in you can increase depending on the quality of environment you dwell in. So if you're in an environment where you have men of God that speak words of faith, you will notice the same is imparted within you. Alright? I remember some years ago when there was one man of God who was testifying and he said how he began to raise the dead and he said uh, it was very simple he was reading the scriptures and while reading the scripture and hearing from other men of God he read the scripture in Matthew 10 and verse number 8 where the Bible says and Jesus is speaking there in Matthew 10 and verse number 8 that you will pray for the sick that you will lay hands for the sick and they will on the sick and they will recover and he also goes ahead and says you will cleanse the lepers and you shall raise the dead he says while reading that scripture something jumped from that scripture and entered him and he kept on listening on of, of testimonies of how certain men of God raised the dead. This man was so intrigued. And so the story goes later on, he made the decision to go ahead and ask his own pastor. Is Matthew 10 verse number 8 active till today? And so the pastor asked him, what does it say? And that's when he read it for the pastor. And the pastor told him, yes, my son, it is so. You can raise the dead. And he asked the pastor, can you, have you ever raised the dead? The pastor was very honest. He told him, no, my son, I've never done so. But if you believe what has been written, then you can go ahead and do so. This man went from village after village looking for dead people to raise he never found any until after two weeks when he found a seven-year-old girl when people were mourning this child just before they would do a burial and that's when this man entered there just being a young believer at that time and he said let no man mourn again for I am here to raise the dead people mocked at him he says no listen I'm about to raise the dead and he said it's even easier that this is a seven-year-old child I have read in the Bible how Jesus raised up a 12-year-old child so this will be easy we will raise up the child he did the first prayer the child never came back to life the second prayer the child never came back to life and he knew very well he would be beaten right there he devised with himself a strategy and told everyone lift up your hand and we want to pray while everyone lifted their hand he was organizing himself to run away made one simple prayer before people knew it he opened the door and he began to run while he was running he gives a story and he says people opened the door following him and they were shouting and him telling him to stop he thought they were looking for a way to catch up with him to beat him up until one shouted and said stop for the girl you were praying for has now risen and she has come back to life and the man stopped he turned he began to brag he told them you know my running was still an exercise in of faith but the truth was he was afraid that they would end up beating him up because they were he felt that since he never saw any result at that time that these guys would see like he was joking with them but from that time this man says he therefore had faith to begin to raise the dead but notice it came as an impartation so there's what we call the law of impartation that is very critical if you will operate in the spirit of faith please remember if you stay around negative reports the only thing you receive is negativity if you stay around positive reports the thing you receive is positive energy a person once also made a research and this is something they also got to discover they say that for an for one negative report to be cancelled it will take seven reports are repeated seven good reports repeated to a person in order to nullify one bad report and the reason is because a human nature okay this human nature has been built in a way that it responds since the fall of Adam it has been built in a way that it responds more to negative reports more than positive reports that's why even news for for news to be sold on television it is negative reports that make people say there is news today anytime you keep on giving good news people will say there is no news today as long as no politician has spoken people are not fighting each other somebody didn't lose a loved one we don't see it as news because a human nature since the fall of adam tends to gravitate around what is negative so they say for a person to nullify one bad report it will take seven repeated reports for that bad report 
Lord to be cancelled. Listen, so that is to say that the best then you will do for yourself is avoid negative reports. Isaiah 53 says, and it to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And the Bible says, and to whom will be, and to and who will believe our report? So God is calling people to learn to listen to his report. Remember Mark chapter 4 and verse 24 says, take heed what you hear, for to the measure that you hear is the same measure that will be given back to you. So you have to be careful. The things that you hear, that's where the law of impartation abides. For the spirit of faith, therefore, to be released to you, you must constantly stay around people that speak faith. Let me say this. In one of the books I've been able to do that I just recently uh, was able to launch and publish and launch, uh, it's called The uh, Leading into Destiny. And I would really encourage those of you that have not been able to get those books, and if you do, I would encourage that you make an effort to make sure you read through those books. Uh, in this book that I was able to do, I launched two of the books just recently, Money Attracts Money, and the other one is Leading into Destiny. In this book, Leading into Destiny, I was able to highlight one of the pointers called Speaking Destiny, into minds speaking destiny into the minds of men i picked it up from the book of second peter chapter number three and verse number one when peter speaks about stirring up the pure minds stirring up the pure minds and then i attached it and i was able to explain that one of the calling of leaders is to make sure that we keep on stirring people's pure minds and we deposit destiny into them so a perfect example in the bible is when we see david giving leader given leadership over three categories of people you can find this uh in the book of first samuel chapter number 23 I, I i think i'm correct when there were three groups of people that david was actually leading the bible says people in debt number two people in despair and number three people who are actually in distress three categories of people people in debt people in despair and people who are also in distress now let me say this that if you're a pastor of those three categories of people you have a lot of work but you notice that in the book of second uh, samuel later on it should be chapter number 21 we now realize the story now changes the bible talks of this great men of david in first samuel the bible speaks about this category of people who are weaklings people in debt people in despair people in distress when people are in debt it means you can't really build or move to the next level as you would desire because they can't give they can't support the dreams of god people have to be financially rested financially liberated in order to freely give towards the work of god and even to be able to have a heart to serve god with their resources but when in debt they really cannot do much because they are servants of another but these same people became the great men of david later on we see them being men of despair again people in despair are people who are always under great discouragement and people also in distress are also in the same category so you have to preach encouragement to them but from first samuel to second samuel we see a translation that david ended up speaking destiny to them and they were able to shift from what they were into something greater impartation is critical if you will operate in the spirit of faith who are you listening to what are you listening to what are the messages you often listen to you only believe in healing if you often listen to messages of healing you believe in a breakthroughs if you listen to messages of breakthrough you believe in financial rest and financial liberation if you listen to such messages but if you're always flooded with negative messages of how the economy is bad how things are not working believe me the spirit of faith cannot enter you remember ezekiel chapter number two and verse number one and verse one ezekiel two the bible says say to me son of man stand up that i may speak to you and the bible says as he spoke his spirit entered me so the spirit of faith enters a person when there is what we call right environment and right speakings availed that's where the law of impartation is available number two we have said the second way that a person can operate or receive the spirit of faith is not only by receiving impartation but ensuring that also you move to a place of praying oftenly in the spirit praying oftenly in the spirit jude verse number 20 okay this is where the need of being full of the holy ghost is very important i want you to listen to me carefully i i don't mind when you're born again and you say you're saved and the only thing that you actually do is just to maintain salvation on its basic level i want you to understand salvation is warfare the day you acknowledge jesus as your lord and savior you declared war you immediately move to the side of christ and you decamped moving away from the camp of the enemy and move to the camp of god which means you declared war right there so from the day you got saved satan has already made sure that he would always throw attacks at you so that means you have 
have to arm yourself. And the arming here is more strongly within, more than it is on the outside. You know, if you read the book of Job, there's something interesting you will see. That when Satan appears to give reports with the Son of Man, God asks Satan a question that, have you considered my servant Job? Listen to the answer of Satan. That's in Job chapter number one. He says, you know you have set a hedge around him, around all that concerns him, and that you have blessed him. You know, three hedges. He explains about the hedge around him, a hedge around all that concerns Job, and also that you have blessed him as an individual. So God protected the family of Job. God protected the things of Job. God protected Job as an individual, and God ensured he also strengthened Job on the inside through the blessing. So listen, God now says, all right, because Satan now tempts God, tempts God and Satan tells God that if a, a man, I mean, Job will only, I'm paraphrasing, Job is only serving you and worshiping you because of the things you have done for him. So God says, all right, you think so? So I will remove the hedge. Go ahead and touch the things that concern him. And so you notice that the sons and the family of Job begin to die. The belongings of Job are also affected. And in one day, Job loses his children and loses all his belongings. The Bible says with that, Job did not curse God. And Job maintained his integrity. Satan now is called back by God. And Satan now tells God, I mean, if I touch his body, he will curse you. And God says, all right, there's no problem. You will touch his body, but you will not touch his soul. So that means now this is where the words of Jesus now become clear. When Jesus says, do not fear the one that can touch uh, your outside body, but the one that touches your soul. And so Satan goes and touches the soul of, I mean, the body of Job. But God has warned him not to touch his soul. Immediately he does so. Again, Job does not curse God. He maintains his integrity. You can find this in Job 1, Job 2, and Job chapter number 3. In all this time, what God wanted to teach the devil is what I've invested in Job. The hedge on the inside is stronger than the hedge on the outside. In other words, most of you may not be aware that God has always been protecting not just you, but everything around you. But the greatest dimension of protection is your inner protection. That is why Christianity is not the life we live on the outside, but Christianity is the life we live from the inside and we manifest it on the outside. So if a believer makes sure that they strengthen the inside continually, they are out outside will ever win the battles. They, they will never struggle. Just the outside will always break forth. That's why we say the greatest attack you can ever have is an internal attack, an, an attack on your prayer life, an attack on your spiritual life. Uh, the attacks on these other things, if they do come, uh, that's okay. But as long as your internal capacity is maintained and you become like what Paul says, that though we were out on the outside, internally we are, we are growing, we, we are daily being renewed. I can assure you, you will always break forth at the end of the day. So what am I bringing out here? This is where the need, therefore, of praying in the spirit is very important. Remember what Jude says in Jude verse number 20, building up yourself in the most holy faith, praying oftenly or always in the spirit. You need as a believer to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You need as a believer to allow the Holy Ghost to flow through you, even with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and allow him to be at work and to be activated on your insight. The more activated you are as a believer, the the more energized you are as a believer, the more you will notice a spirit of faith works on your inside. Remember Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 26. The spirit of God knoweth our infirmities, our limitations. And what does he do? He therefore prays for us with groans that words cannot be able to express when we do not know what we ought to pray for. So the Holy Ghost within you is the energy you need to release the spirit of faith on the inside of you. Number three, the third way you're able to receive or activate or operate in the spirit of faith is when as a believer you have the discipline of listening to God's word. When as a believer you have the discipline of reading and listening to the word of God. Please remember, Christianity is not just an attribute of just an encounter you have. The encounter is essential because the encounter leaves the marks of Christ on you. But Christianity is an attribute of disciplines that you build spiritually. Now remember in Matthew chapter number 6 what Jesus said. He said, when you give. Again, he said, when you pray. Again, he said, when you fast. So he never said, if you give if you pray or if you fast. He said when. So Jesus basically was trying to tell the believer that it is necessary for you to understand that Christianity is a discipline you build. You must have a discipline that you build often. Did you ever know 
that you are alive not only because God wants you to be alive, but there are disciplines that you have actually been given without you knowing. For example, no one actually reminds you to brush your teeth. You don't need the Holy Ghost to tell you you need to go take a shower. You don't need a revelation to eat food in the morning that you need breakfast, you need lunch, or you need supper. In your system, there's a discipline that has been built automatically that you feel uncomfortable uh, or you don't feel fresh if you never took a shower. So there's that discipline that has been built that freshness comes when you take a shower. There's a discipline that gives you comfort to talk to other people because you know you have been able to brush your teeth. Brushing is not just keeping your teeth clean, but also giving allowing you to have fresh breath so that in your conversation you don't throw an aura that will confuse the atmosphere. I hope you get what I'm saying. You know, you eat because you know in eating you are able to energize yourself. The food that you eat, we usually say you are, you are what you eat. So in the same way, believers must understand that the context of sustaining your spirituality or your salvation is actually through your disciplines. You cannot do without praying. How do you wake up and you just begin a day without praying? How do you wake up and you can't even be able to read the Bible? How, how, you know, I look at believers and I say, you're crazy. Listen to what I've always repeated. The same way the physical body, this body, the earthly body requires oxygen to live, which even right now, people have to pray, pay that are actually facing COVID-19 in order to be able to sustain themselves, that they buy oxygen. So can you imagine that your physical body requires oxygen to live? In the spirit, your spiritual man requires the presence of God. The oxygen of your spiritual man is God's presence. So without God, without God's presence, the spirit man begins to die. And that is where you will notice that most of who you are gets affected. So as a believer, you must build addictions of God's for God's presence. You must build addictions for God's presence. And you can only do this through disciplines. As a believer, build a discipline of reading the Bible. Build a discipline of waking up to pray. Praying often during the day. If you didn't feel like you had a breakthrough in the morning, have a culture of building within yourself the habit of even praying throughout the day until when you feel the heavens are opened up. I've oftenly said, we do not pray to finish. We pray to encounter. So if you notice you didn't have that release you wanted to have, no, number one, as long as you prayed, it was by faith. So no heaven has opened it up. But have that appetite, that desire to want to feel the manifest presence of God. And you will notice when you do so, even during the day, you will keep on praying. And you will notice in the process of prayer, the heavens will be open. Now this is something that we learn through the life of Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter number three, we discover that when Jesus Jesus was being baptized. The Bible does not just say that Jesus was baptized. He says as he was being baptized by John the Baptist, he was praying. And as he prayed, the heavens were open and the Holy Ghost came lightened upon him in form of a dove. So he made sure he mingled the baptism with prayer. And in the process of prayer, the encounters of heaven began to manifest. Please, I want to encourage you that God wants to release to the body of Christ and more so to you who are watching me, the spirit of faith. We are living in tough times, in seasons when it is what is on the inside that helps you beat what is on the, house, on the outside. And the only way that can happen is to constantly have the spirit of faith built on the inside of you. When the spirit of faith is built on the inside of you, the Bible says we bearing the same spirit of faith, believed. So that means when you have that spirit in you active, your believing is strengthened. And when he says we believed, what did we do? He says, therefore, we have spoken. So everything you will be saying, if I sit down with you today, and every time you're telling me, you know, pastor, this thing, it's very hard. I don't know whether I can make it. You know, the way things are, there's no money and stuff like that. I can immediately tell that you do not have the spirit of faith within you. I can say that the spirit working in you is a wrong spirit. It's a spirit of doubt, a spirit of fear. A spirit of depression. But if I sit down with you and every time you're telling me, Pastor, I know God is opening a door. I may not understand it, but I know something is surely coming through. Then I know what is working on the inside of you is known as a spirit of faith. Why? Because he says, we bearing the same spirit of faith believed. So the signs to show that somebody has a spirit of faith is believing and speaking. We can tell it by the things you say and we can tell it by the quality of belief that you have on the inside of you. I trust that today something has begun. Just this day being the first day, I know I've changed my days. I'm supposed to be starting on Mondays, but I've just happened to change it because I do quite a lot and I opted Mondays. You will just allow your pastor to be taking a break. So Tuesday to Fridays will be on in Therapua. And I want you to build up together with me because this week we'll be looking at the spirit of faith. And I've told you there are three ways that this spirit can come into your life. Number one, impartation. Number two, by praying oftenly in the spirit. And if in case you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, we will be praying praying tomorrow for you to be baptized. Number three, 
We have talked about building spiritual disciplines in which you must maintain disciplines of prayer, disciplines of studying the word of God, and disciplines of staying within a fellowship that constantly keeps you, and also disciplines of staying holy as a believer. Righteousness is not just a spiritual thing that just happens because you prayed. It's also a decision you make. You choose to live a holy life and you set principles you set principles so that you can be able to live that quality of life and i'm praying for you that this spirit will not fail in your life so today i release my faith and i release it on your behalf that the lord impart in you the spirit of faith in the name of Jesus, I pull down every thought exalting itself against the knowledge of God within you. I tear down every darkness that may have confused, corrupted, or defiled your system on the inside and caused you to become negative in your thinking and begin to build a complaining spirit. I cast it out of you. I cast out depression. I pray every darkness on the inside of you to depart and I release light on the inside of you. I pray that the Lord energize you once again and cause you to rise out of that wave of depression and begin to soar higher in Jesus. Jesus precious name. May the spirit of faith be released on your inner man in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to pray for somebody who may be watching also and probably you're not born again or you're backslidden and you know very well that you have never ever been able to rededicate your life to Christ or even ever given your life to Christ. I do not want to assume you're probably watching or you will even watch later. I want you to make this simple prayer after me. Say Heavenly Father, I acknowledge I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And I ask you to show me mercy and wash me with your blood today. Make me your son and be my Lord and be my Savior. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You're already born again. I want you to take the liberty of just communicating with me either via messenger or you can just go ahead and get the numbers available there and send me a message so that we can be able to interact and talk far much more. I'm done for today, but I want you to join me tomorrow again. We will be back here 10 minutes past 12. 10 minutes past 12. Tomorrow, the day after, and Friday, we are going to be praying for the sick. We are going to be trusting God for supernatural miracles. Those that are not baptized with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, will also pray pray for you to receive the baptism of the Spirit. But I also want you to join me today still as I continue in the lunch hour program this week. I will be dealing still with activating priesthood. I've just had this burden and I'm not yet done with it and I feel the need of building on it more so dealing with the aspect of sacrifices. Remember, it's essential that God helps you to strengthen your priesthood. Your, your, your strength spiritually matters in life. So I want you to be together with me. Join me. If you can't physically, come. Don't miss it. If you're within elder, please come. We are here at Comora Center on 4th floor, room number 414, 415. We are actually here. Just come on 4th floor. You will be able to get us. We are here every Monday all the way up until Friday. And on Sundays, we are actually here from 10 o'clock. So you can be with me today at 1 o'clock exactly. Just in the next four minutes, we are going to be beginning our lunch hour. Also, ensure that also you get a book. If you haven't gotten a book uh, that we were able to launch and you're within Eldred, I want you to make an effort and also get the books that I was able to launch. If you are in Nairobi, please prepare on the 25th of July. I'll be giving you far much more details this week. Uh, we are going to be having a book launch in Nairobi. So prepare yourself. Those that are in Nairobi and those around the environs of Nairobi, whether Kiambu, uh, even Embu, my people in Moya, I want you to come on that specific day, 25th. It will be a Sunday. We'll be doing the program from 3.30 in the afternoon all the way up until about 6 o'clock. So don't miss a book launch. More details will be posted as we continue. If you're within Elder was in Gishu Western around this region, Akuru and stuff like that. Make an effort, get the books, they are fully available. You can come to our offices. If you want to be a blessing to the ministry, the numbers are available there. You can give your offerings. They are actually, you can use that number and also partner together with me. God <clears throat> will bless you. Thank you all for joining me. Let's see you for lunch hour in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs>